Thank you. Yeah, so my name is Randall Kuhn, and I'm a neuroscientist, and I'm the founder of carboncopies.org. So we're all traveling into the future, our children as well and our grandchildren, so it's really important to us what that future is like. And when a future is really good, when it's something where our species thrives, we call it a utopia. When it's bad, we call it a dystopia. And we have some agency in what it's going to be, because right now we have at our disposal a global economy, a global infrastructure, and global science that we can direct to various problems that we think are important. So when I mention a dystopia, I'm pretty sure that you have some idea of what I mean, because basically science fiction novels and movies, they display all kinds of dystopias. There are many different types, and usually they're things like the end of the world, which can happen in many different ways. For example, it could be something that we do, an environmental catastrophe, or it could be uh, something like, say, robot wars or a meteor impact. But it can also be something else where there isn't really an end to humanity, it's just that civilization disappears and people start behaving towards one another in a way that seems like there's no compassion. So we, we feel like we're being treated like objects or resources, which we don't want. So what is this civilization that stands between us and dystopia? Let's go back a little bit and think about evolution and rather about the selection process that makes evolution happen. This is a really powerful concept because it's been shaping the past and it's going to be shaping the future everywhere all the time. Daniel Dennett called this universal Darwinism, and it doesn't just apply to living things, it applies to all sorts of stuff. Consider, for example, a large porous asteroid colliding with a small, dense asteroid. What's going to happen? There's going to be a selection for small, dense objects that persist for longer in a greater area of space. Now we can extrapolate from this and think, what are the selection pressures that are going to affect an intelligent species in the long-term future? But we'll get back to that later. First, I want to point out that evolution also brought us into a place where we're able to communicate and interact with people and build societies and civilization. Civilization is a way for us to explore things and do things that aren't possible just through raw competition. It allows us to cooperate and do things like understand more, create more, even if sometimes these creations are just to be somehow more pleasant to us on an aesthetic sphere. So really it's a catch-all for ways to cooperate. But there are other aspects to this as well. For example, empathy. As we become more empathic, the cooperation becomes less one of hierarchical coercion and more one of cooperation by empathy. And we see this in lots of places. Right now, for example, in the United States, it's an election year, so you'll see these things come up a lot as issues. Some people will say, it's really important for us to be competitive and to be hard workers. And others will say, it's important to be uh, cooperative and empathetic and to help those in need so that it lifts up all of society. Now, when you put together empathy and cooperation, you can get ethics, and ethics are really important because they're really a way of respecting differences. Differences between individuals, differences between groups, differences between goals. We're all really interested in belonging, in feeling that we are stronger in a group where we feel there are lots of commonalities, there's a lot that's the same. It's very important to us, it's some, way, some part of how uh, we fall in love, make families, friends, interest groups, and even nations. But even in then, in the background, we still want those differences of our background, our creative ideas, to be respected. So we really want protection of these minority ideas of our own against some possible tyranny of the uniform majority. Again, we see in civilization here something that shows us what a dystopia would be. For example, sort of a machine world of uniformity. Imagine if we had one computer program that we thought was superior and we made a million copies of that and let it rule the world. That would be a dystopia. So, Evolution happens in a particular environment and in an epoch. We are evolved to be suitable for a certain place and time such that we best operate in that environment. This isn't always going to be the case. Earth isn't always going to be the best safeguard for humanity. It could happen because of something we do, and maybe eventually, if we just have to wait long enough, it's because the sun uh, grows larger during its cycle and eventually engulfs the Earth, and then we have to move somewhere else. But if we're not very well adapted, it means we need to move somewhere else and take the biosphere of Earth with us. We have to drag it around. I mean, just think of Neil Armstrong, for example. He wasn't really able to experience being on the moon and touching it because he still had to be encased in a piece of Earth's atmosphere and inhale his own sense. So that's one issue. The other one is that our senses and our thinking are evolved to the challenges that were prevalent, that were important millions of years ago. That's quite not always optimal. Um, so we can wonder now, if we take this, what does it mean if we go back to the concept of universal Darwinism for a species 
to be one that works well in, in a large part of universal space-time. Uh, and we can look at ourselves and say, what is it that made us be able to inhabit and influence a large part of the Earth? It's because we were able to adapt and augment ourselves. We have clothes, we have cars, we have cell phones, we have houses. These sorts of things make that possible. And uh, if we think that out, then we think, okay, so beings, species that are very adaptable are going to be inhabiting and influencing the largest parts of space-time overall. So being augmented is actually very human. It's something that we teach our children from a young age, is how to use our minds to augment our bodies. Think, for example, about how you learn to drive. A car is really something much stronger and faster than your limbs, but it becomes your own after a while and you learn how to operate it so that you can steer through difficult, complex traffic situations. Our minds have been coping by specializing, by depending on others for various other tasks. And now we've been using computers and networks like the internet to speed things up further and keep bringing in information. We've been offloading tasks. We used to learn things like lots of history uh, points in, about the history of our country. Now we need to learn how to ask the right questions, how to type in the right Google phrases to get the answers. So we've been offloading a lot of the computation, a lot of the collection of data, a lot of how we go about these things in life. But in the meantime, we've been living longer and we've been experiencing more. But what does that really mean if you are living longer and experiencing more? What are you? What is identity? What is self? And by contrast, what is everything else? Well, you're sitting here and you're listening to me and you're sitting on the chair, you're feeling the chair, you're hearing things. But those are already processed things. This is all stuff that's already been generated somewhere. Um, your whole concept of where you are, your when and where, uh, this entire idea that you're in this place, this is all stuff that's been processed. Without the processing, there really is nothing. So processing in the mind is being. And um, so uh, the, the, the being that we have here is something that we really need to understand. If we can understand better that that is really what's going on, then we can learn to become more enlightened and to move to some better goals that we have, for example. So, for instance, we don't like to hurt our friends because we understand them better. We have more kinship with them. And if we understand being better, then that moves our entire culture forward. So these processes I was talking about, they're not really uh, specific to something that could only happen in a human brain. These are things that could happen on other substrates. And that's really where the uh, solution lies in terms of dealing with the adaptability that we need to have to move the sub these processes of the mind to other substrates, to become substrate independent or SIM. That opens up a whole plethora of possibilities because we're no longer dependent on one environment and we can go out and create new ways of thinking and sensing. Imagine, for example, being able to remember with the precision of a database or being able to come up with optimal solutions with the ease of a quantum computer. So now the question is, how would you do this? A substrate independent mind, ideally, you would have it tuned to a specific type of hardware, that it would work best on the substrate that it's on. But we can't really do that yet, because we just don't understand enough about how the mind works to make these kinds of precise uh, tunings. We don't know that. We, we really don't understand all the structures of the mind from the top down to the cellular level. What we need to do instead is we need to look at the things that neuroscience has been good at for the last hundred years. Neuroscience has looked at how do you identify elements of these physiology, this physiology in the brain, and how do you measure compounds, how do you measure signals at the level of neurons and synapses. So basically all approaches today that are trying to do substrate independent minds are approaching it through a very conservative route that we call whole brain emulation. Now, I know that you know what emulation is because, for example, if you've ever come across a program that allows you to run PC software on a Macintosh, then you know what an emulator is. In engineering, emulation always means system identification. You have some process that is producing from input and output. In this black box, you need to find out what the functions are that are going on in there. The first thing that you need to do, then, is to know what is the input and what is the output that you're interested in. If you're trying to emulate a chip, it's pretty simple. It's the stream of ones and zeros that are going in and out, which are really voltages at different levels. But there are lots of other signals, for example, cosmic rays, noise on those potentials, and even the way that the chip is heating up. Those things aren't interesting. And the same kind of decision has to be made when you look at the brain. There are some signals that are really interesting, like action potentials or spikes. Every time that we have sensory activity, that produces spikes. Spikes are also used to drive motor activity. So for example, me speaking to you, 
and the distance, the delay between spikes is crucial for laying down memory and synapses. So we could say if we can predict all the spikes in the brain and when they're going to happen, then we'd have an emulation. So you see, now we're already talking about a concrete roadmap of how you would do SIM and what kind of requirements are there. So let's look at the first requirement, which is how big is that black box going to be? How big can we make it and still figure out what the functions are that are inside it? If we make the black box as big as the human brain, then it would probably take an entire lifespan of that brain to keep on observing input and output to be able to say something about it. And even then, what you deduce would be flawed and would be missing a lot of latent function. Really, you need to break it down into a bigger understanding of what the input output is and what the architecture is inside of that brain. The second requirement is that you need a platform where you can run an emulation. And what is that going to take? How much does that take? Well, let's assume that to simplify the system identification problem, we did scans of the structure and we broke down every neuron into a whole bunch of compartments, what we call a compartmental model. And each of those compartments is represented as an electrical circuit and it runs something called the Hodgkin-Huxley equations. Now also know that for every action potential in the brain, you need a certain amount of ATP, that's energy at the cellular level, and we know that 20 to 40 watts are going to the brain. So we can calculate from that how many events can be happening in a certain unit of time. Now, if you want to do that many events in a model that has compartmental neurons with, say, 10,000 compartments each, then on a supercomputer, a general one, it would take about one exaflop. That's 100 times faster than the fastest computer today. But even then, Europe, the USA, and even India are saying that by 2017 to 2020, they're going to have exaflop computing centers online. And that's the brute force approach. We actually know a lot more about what we're trying to build, so we would probably prefer to co-design it to some hardware that is neuromorphic. A good example is the work that's being done in the DARPA Synapse project at IBM. So really, computation isn't the hurdle. The big hurdle is getting all that data at large scale and high resolution out of the brain. So the third requirement is that we want to go in there and get this, this specific structural data, the human connectome for an individual brain out. And that's all about getting more parameters so that this problem becomes even easier to solve. How do you get that system identification problem solved? Now, luckily, this is a really hot topic. Connectomics is really hot right now. And in 2011, two very good papers came out by two groups that basically did proof of, uh, proof of concept that you could do system identification in the retina and in the visual cortex by using what's called serial block face scanning electron microscopy in the lab by Winfried Denk to make these slices and then reconstruct neurons and also use functional recording with two photon microscopy. At the same time, um, Ken Hayworth, who is a strong proponent of whole brain emulation, has been improving his technique for doing these kinds of slices by making a parallelizable version of, fo of, uh, sorry, of uh, focused ion beam, uh, sorry, I'm forgetting the word, but anyway, it's called FibSem. And what you end up with is you can create these structures that show you the morphology of neurons and where they are in space, how they relate to one another. So this problem is moving ahead quite fast. The last requirement is that you need to gather reference points at a high resolution so that you can collect data that will allow you to correct and tune the parameters of this model that you're creating for the system identification so you can verify whether this is working. And that's where neuroscience so far has only been able to either extract data at a few points at high resolution with electrodes or get a really low resolution picture of the entire thing using fMRI or MRI. Now, if we try to continue to make these external imaging methods better, you run into a physics problem because if you want to get really high resolution at distance, you need to put in a lot of power, and that's damaging. And if you're trying to measure while you're damaging the neural tissue, your measurements may be off. Now, what the brain does, of course, when it wants to get those measurements, it stays really close. It's using these microscopic synaptic receptor channels to register what's there. And to get the quantity of data, it's using a huge hierarchy of connections. We can borrow from those ideas and we can use similar procedures. And there are three things we can do. First, we can start making arrays with very many electrodes. Then we can build something that tries to work at the molecular scale using molecular material like DNA to record activity in the brain. It's called a molecular ticker tape. And then finally, we have an approach where we're building a, a hierarchical system that is very small, that's at the red blood cell, cell scale, using integrated circuit technology, which has already been shown in prior work to be combinable with living cells. If you're going to do that, 
then what you do is you have an integrated circuit at a size of eight micron where you can put now as many transistors as on the original Intel I4004 processor, and you can power it with either mag magnetic induction or with light or with something like glucose biofuel cells. You can use either the voltage sensing over a capacitor to record from neurons, or if you're using voltage sensitive proteins in the system at the same time, you can use an optical method for recording that. Now, if you want to collect all this data that you're gathering, and you want to be able to bring it to the outside, and you also want to be able to re register location either directly or through triangulation, then you need all of these cells to work together as a team. All of these agents have to work as basically a small network that resides side by side with the brain. This is a very ambitious new project to create a recording technique for in vivo work inside the brain. And it's being done in collaboration with MIT and Harvard. But what it really comes down to is that we have a future in which either we cannot play a very large role or we have to be very adaptable. And it matters now because right now, even though it's really a, a really ambitious goal to do something about these huge problems that universal Darwinism is going to throw in our face, we have an opportunity to work on it because we have these, this intact civilization with uh, a, a, a big economy, even though it's been shaken a little bit, and we have uh, lots of scientists and lots of research going on and a very well-functioning infrastructure, and we don't really know if we're going to have that in 20 years, 40 years, 60 years. We just can't tell. So what are our descendants going to say whether we should have taken this opportunity or not? What we have is an opportunity to understand ourselves better, to know more about why we're here, what it means to be, and even to create with us a species that can thrive into the long-term future. So I would say that we have to take this opportunity and work on that. So thank you very much.